We are recording. Ah, well, in that case, welcome to the IPFS Weekly in GUI and Web Browser Sync Call. Um, as is tradition, we shall all go and stare at the agenda for a second and see if anyone has any agenda points to add. Uh, we shall beseech the audience for a note taker. Anyone available? Anyone stepping forward? Okay, no. <laughs> Jim Pick. Thanks, Jim. Um, and also take a moment to add any agenda items that you would like to, anything in the in web browser integration or the GUI team's purview. What would you like to talk about? Um, while people are ruminating on their desires for the agenda, we shall do a round of what I done last week, what I gonna do next week. And as is customary, Lidl is at the top of the list. So, Lidl, could you talk to us a little bit about what the highlights were for you last week? Uh, okay. Um, so, sharing my screen. Uh, last week, uh, a stable release of uh, IPFS Compiling Extension uh, with new web UI, with uh, Window IPFS V2. So, Window IPFS enable method is a async method that lets you ask for multiple uh, permissions in bulk. It's ready to play it with it in wild. It's in both stable and uh, beta channel. And uh, yep, uh, that's uh, ready for install. We had a discussion with Brave and there's like a post uh, with plan how we can speed up uh, bringing IPFS to Brave by avoiding shipping Go IPFS binary and uh, writing all the orchestration related to that. Instead, if we could empower JS IPFS node running in IPFS companion to have uh, similar powers, namely expose HTTP gateway uh, using some uh, more powerful APIs that our extension could get a special access to. So uh, plan and pros and cons of the, bo both approaches uh, it's sort of long, but I try to make it uh, a good case why uh, JSIPFS may be ready, or at least may be ready at some point in 2018. And there's like a related issue about those uh, hidden by default in Chromium, uh, hidden by default in like uh, Google Chrome. Uh, but uh, if we uh, get uh, a blessed extension status in Brave, we could gain access to those APIs and uh, have things like exposing HTTP gateway in similar fashion that Go IPFS does, and also like do local discovery and TCP transport, similarly to the web experiments we did uh, in the past year, things like that. And uh, on the CID uh, and base 32 front, we have uh, like uh, public gateway is coming along uh, nicely. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, Kyle posted some updates in this uh, main uh, issue. Uh, yeah, with updates, for, like general summary from Go IPFS and JS IPFS uh, companion as well. Uh, companion uh, detects uh, um, CIDs uh, in subdomains and displays uh, page actions. There's a related issue why I mentioned it is how should we handle uh, websites loaded like with CID in subdomain. Uh, the thing is that uh, if we load a website uh, that using CID in subdomain, then this website gets a security and isolation guarantees provided by origin-based isolation built in to every web browser vendor. But the thing is that if IPFS companion redirects that uh, website to local gateway, then this origin-based security perimeter disappears because uh, we only have like one origin for all websites. Um, so the question is, uh, how should we handle uh, CID in subdomain websites? And that's sort of a similar case with DN DNS link websites because if you have a, your own domain, then you have origin-based security perimeter. But if we redirect that website to a local gateway, then it's just on the IPFS slash domain path, which shares the origin with other websites. Uh, so there are different uh, solutions to that. Some are 
sort of wishful thinking right now. Some are very messy and uh, I think the best that we can do is to uh, do not redirect by default with the assumption that if someone is loading website with CID in subdomain, they care about origin separation. What we could do is to display page actions uh, just like we do for uh, like uh, right now, right? Display that this website was loaded with public gateway and what we could do is to add additional option below to either uh, open that website on local gateway, but that would be an opt-in, like conscious opt-in by the user or we could like opt-in for automatic redirect. So from, for this website, it's fine to redirect. Um, I'm open for suggestions. Uh, if anyone has a, a better idea or a way we could handle it more gracefully, uh, the issue I linked would be great. And that's sort of uh, uh, it from my end. Uh, just like to finish up and I'll take questions. Uh, on the next, in the next week, I want to, I have like a baked in PR about, about uh, opting out from redirects for specific websites, namely, let's say on DTube, uh, if IPFS companion is running and redirecting, uh, it may break the website. People should have a possibility just like in uBlock uh, to opt out from, uh, for, from IPFS companion redirect only for a specific website. And that's sort of related to this. In this, uh, like, uh, discussion about subdomains we would like to opt in and uh, there should be like also like opt out so that's like a, something i would do like to figure it out in the following week and also maybe if time allows uh, go back to break and i'll stop sharing and take questions there is the um <clears throat> so the situation right now is companion detects cids in subdomains and redirects them uh, it does not <laughs> it does not it does okay. not, but the problem is that we do redirect for DNS-linked websites, which is sort of the same situation. So we also need to unify both, I think. Mm. Yeah, it seems like we need to, to do a round of significant UX thinking around all of this. <clears throat> okay. Well, what was my other thought? I had another one. It's gone. Any other questions? Um, it would be good to talk a little bit more about the conversation you had with Brave. I would add that to the agenda for to come back to after we've done a round. Okay. Sure. Um, Diogo, you're up next. How's your week been? Hello, guys. Uh, I think my network is pretty unstable, so if something I drop my connection or something, don't worry, I'll be okay. <laughs> Good. Okay, so you can see my screen. What I did uh, last week, I fixed a rendering issue that was happening in Firefox, in the file, file operations in preview mode. Yeah, as I was saying, my network is not very good. So basically there was an issue with this SVG that was taking up the whole screen. Now it's, it's okay. So you can uh, do operations on the files in preview mode. Uh, I'm just praying for the CI to pass. I don't know, it's always failing. I'll just restart. Uh, more. Uh, specifically on that CI, the, <clears throat> the no, it, it, it's on all the CIs. All my pull requests are failing because it's timing out. Okay, I don't think it's any anything with my code. Uh, I also refactored refactored the drag and drop um, to the whole page because we could only drag and drop files and folders to to the file list when we only had one file, we will just have to drop them in here. Now we can drop uh, even on other pages, for example, in status, if I drag and drop, you can see this overlay. It redirects us to, to the files page and we will add the file. 
and uh, it still you know it still enable us to to drop in specific uh, folders i'm not really i'm not totally comfortable with this um how can i say these interactions because we have this overlay then when we drag to the file list it gets a bit of opacity and then highlights the folder i really don't like this i have to, to think of another way to do this but it's working i'll make that in another pull request for now i think it's best and it's not uh, it doesn't have a high priority right now i agree i think that's already an improvement and we can make it better yeah uh, then i had a lot of sessions with Oli. thank you to uh, fix and, and some knowledge transfer of the idea of the explorer so we basically fix the um, the exploring of seaboard nodes to work with the new APIs. Uh, what's missing is the DAG PB nodes, the protobots one. I think we'll we'll have to fix that this week. Uh, I released two versions of the IPLD explorer components. I kind of started to release the web UI with those fixes, but uh, I'm I'm a bit blocked with the bundle size. I have to check what, what's happening with that. After that, just merge the public list and release any question of the web UI. Uh, next week, uh, make the IPLD explorer work with the latest changes of like whatever, and continue to push for the web UI for the next uh, minor release. It's basically improving the file manager. We have a lot of stuff to do, and that's basically it. Uh, a lot of stuff you've done, it's just in pull requests, but yes. Next, yeah, this, week, this week is 2.4. Yeah. Some of these are just waiting to be merged. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Zoom share. I I will share my desktop. Do, 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 do. Um, the most interesting thing for GUI world this week was actually having just enough time and enough credentials to push through to get signed installers of the IPFS desktop app on OS X. And oh my, oh my, is that it's surprisingly complicated for a, for a setup that you would think would, you know, you definitely want to happen. Um, these are now like, this is the distillation of the process that I added and there's various like UX horrors in there. The problem being we're building an Electron app um, and we want to apply the certificates that we created uh, during uh, the continuous integration process. So the challenge here is that I think a lot of the UX improvements around signing apps has gone into Apple's Xcode app and we are not using that, we are using JavaScript and Electron and Electron Builder. Anyway, so there was, um, it was a lot of work, but the summary is, uh, for anyone who might be building an Electron app, there is a bullet point guide on all the things you have to do. And there is also, just quickly, boo, 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 what have I got here? I've got a DMG 7, 0.7, so this is the latest release. Um, so I've kicked, I've incremented the version number, just one thing that hadn't quite clicked for me with the, IPFS desktop release process was um, the Electron Builder um, is quite interesting and it runs in CI, builds out your artifacts on every commit to master. And if there is a, a draft release on GitHub releases uh, that's already been created, then it will publish the latest version of the installers to that draft release. And so then every build to master will just change, it'll just replace the artifacts on the draft release until you hit publish the release and then those artifacts uh, are frozen and then uh, then you bump the number so you're kind of always like that we're building 0.7 now we're not 0.7 is the number in the package version but we haven't committed to which particular commit we're going to tag as 0.7 so it's the opposite way around to how we do it with a lot of other projects where we don't bump the version number until we are about ready to do the tag anyway that's all sorted out. Um, this is marginally underwhelming if you care about user experience, but um, the fact is you can now install the app. Wait a second. Now, what used to happen when you would run the app is OSX would pop up a warning that says, this application is unsigned and unknown, so 
you can't install it. So it basically has this warning message, but with no, no way to run it. So this is this in UX terms is a, it's somewhere between like a very minor improvement because you still get a warning or a huge improvement because the user can open and run. Whereas before it was like, don't run this. It's made by monsters. You shouldn't touch it. Um, so now after many, many days of talking to Jesse Claiborne and dealing with bizarre <laughs> admin rituals, we have signed binaries. So that is a step forward. Um, less exciting is the, it is a hundred percent better. I agree. Um, less exciting is the windows story is still on hold while we're waiting to get certificates we've applied and they are going to go and do some due diligence and check that protocol labs is an organization. And eventually they'll send us some certs and we'll go through the same dance with that. But at least I've done it now so I know where everything goes. Um, boop, 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 boop. What else is going on? Other exciting things paired with Diogo. That was great. We learned lots about the guts of the IPLD Explorer code. Um, and we will do some more pairing on those changes next week. Just dealing with that, there's been. I kind of saw that there was lots of API changes coming for IPLD and some of the dependencies like DAGPB. Uh, so I kind of ignored all of the changes for a few months and so that we could tackle a whole bunch of them in one go. Um, I don't think I would do that again because it turned the change, change fest into quite a long process. Um, so I think I've learned my lesson. I think we should just do rapid, regular releases of IPLD um, Explorer as the, that API continues to change. But we live and learn. Um, otherwise, it's been admin stuff, IPFS comp planning, and uh, interviewing, and uh, the next steps for the um, self hosted analytics. I just need to do uh, a call to action on the status page because we want to make it opt in so that we don't offend anybody. Um, if we are to get any analytics out of the self hosted analytics, I'm going to just do a little banner on the status page when you first run and it says, please uh, help us make this better and enable the analytics. Uh, the other part of that is I have to write some infrastructure Terraform code as a proposal for the infrastructure team to review so that I can then hand over the management of the service and not have to run a self-hosted DigitalOcean droplet forevermore. Any questions? Something in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry for my scratchy. I'll wear fewer items of clothing next time. Um, that's me. Any questions? No questions? Please no. Good. That's fine. Statements is fine too. Um, next week, I'm going to be focused on uh, Web UI 2.4 release. Um, I think there's probably too many things left to do to get it done all next week, but we're going to get as close as we can. Um, in the week. Actias is not with us today, but he has been ill, so not a huge amount of stuff, but he's been focused on the context menu for Windows users. So integrating IPFS desktop with the operating system so that you can right click on a folder and say add to IPFS. And I think this PR is ready to review, so it works, which is exciting. Um, so <laughs> someone gets to install Windows and try it, or uh, we all get to install Windows and try it. Um, hello, ah, this chat window. Yep, yep, once in Mac OS. Yeah, so I'm not even sure if this is something that's particularly easy to do in Mac OS, but that's where the area of research needs to happen. Diogo, he has a hand. Yeah, because uh, last week I took like a morning to, to see that how we could make that in Mac OS again. It's not really easy. Basically, we have to make an automated script and, and plug it in the, the installer. OK, I mean, if, that, if it's, that was my reading of it as well, like if we make the automated script and it works and the installer can copy it into the right location, then I think it's doable. The question yeah, is, whether, is whether we should. Yeah, I don't think there's just too many information around that because I saw a lot of questions and no responses. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we'll be the ones to go there and respond to everyone. You can be like, oh yeah, tell you what, no problem. And then everyone's context menu starts getting like this. 
one million of things from every single application you ever installed. Um, uh, uh, blocked, yeah, we're waiting on the Windows certificate. Okay, that is myself and Henrik. Uh, Terry, did you want to update us? I'll stop sharing my screen. Sure. Okay, so a few things that are at least somewhat related to this group. So Alan spent some time with me yesterday as I just tried to start from scratch at js.ipfs.io, I think is where I was, and <laughs> just find, learn, try, what I was trying to do is find resources about the file API that already exists because I'm trying to build a proto school tutorial. So we went through some of the resources that were there together, and in the notes here, you can see a link to the issue where we're talking about what the proto school tutorial will look like. So I laid out a proposal that would have actually two tutorials, one of them about the stuff that I think is, it, it's like not MFS, it's technically the core stuff and, uh, you know, cat and those kinds of things. And then a second one that would be about MFS. Um, when I mentioned that to Michael, he had been envisioning only covering the MFS stuff and completely skipping the other stuff. So this is a, a point of perhaps some debate that needs to happen. So I'd be very open to any feedback on that PR before I get started building. So please go check that out. Um, while we were on that main page, there's like a file exchange demo that's built in where you see the code on the left and then you see the app that it builds on the right. And when I tried to drag and drop into there, I got a type error, which Alan identified as being because of a uh, change that was made recently to the API where you're not supposed to include the word files anymore when you type stuff. But I, I'm like completely lost in GitHub. I don't know where the repo is for that website. So I don't know where to log this issue if that would be helpful or if one of you wants to do it. So you can either paste me a link and I'm happy to or whatever works for you. Um, and then some, not me, but one of our chapter leaders for Proto School has proposed a tutorial that would be about hosting static websites on IPFS. And I remembered that there is an OKR for one of these two groups that are on this call about making it easier to do or possible to do or one of these things in uh, JS IPFS. My impression is that you can do that and go now and not quite on JS and maybe the next release of JS IPFS will support it or something along these lines. So I put a few notes after kind of pinging Ollie and Lytle, I put a few notes in that issue to kind of respond to the guy who's there. But this is one where when I talked to Michael about it, he would like to prioritize this as one of the most, uh, most urgent tutorials to build after we get the file one out the door. So if you guys have any thoughts on what that would look like, feel free to throw them in that issue, which is linked there. Um, and then the other thing that might be of interest to some of you on this group, I don't know how much you speak at conferences, meetups, whatever, but I started a, this is not actually what I started. Sorry, let me put the right word in here. I started a speaking channel in Slack. Um, this is one of my OKRs on the sort of company-wide version of the community team, is to help employees have a place, an ongoing place to improve their speaking skills. So one of the ways we'll do it is just conversation in Slack. If you see a cool article about slide design or battling imposter syndrome or whatever kind of thing that might be. Um, and then I'm also planning to set up a semi-monthly call where we'll have an opportunity to give, to, like if you have a presentation coming up, you can book it on the calendar, give your presentation on the call, get feedback from other people who are hopefully experienced speakers and um, get some tips on how to move forward. The equivalent of this call at IBM was everyone on my developer advocacy team's favorite call of the week. It was just an awesome place to kind of brainstorm together and share ideas and in a group where that was very forgiving and also had a lot of good feedback. So um, I hope that people will join that. So you can go over to that Slack channel. There's a comment there about the call. Just click on the little hands up icon if you want to be included when they get that. It'll be on the public calendar, but as I try to find the time that works, I will consider people who clicked the hand emoji. Uh, and my next, like my big priority right now is uh, building that files tutorial for Proto School file API, and I need to work on a roadmap. So hmm. that's what's next up for me. 
Does anybody have questions on any of the stuff I just talked about? Thank you, whoever just put that. Oh, never mind. Somebody made an issue. Thank you. It was, yeah, uh, the speaking channel sounds great. And yeah, Alan's just saying that he created a bunch of issues from your time together. Okay, perfect. And Tioga says he built it, so he can also be useful in fixing it. Perfect. Nice. Um, boom, 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 boom. Hugo, Mr. Diaz, would you like to tell us how it's going? Yes. Let me share. Okay, so I reviewed the pull request from Alan about uh, loading the IPLD formats. Did a bunch of research about it. <coughs> also fixed the problem um, about the IPFS not uh, connecting to the bootstrap nodes because of in the browser uh, it was related uh, to um, a package I built for the bundle size work. Um, basically, uh, people that are still using like Babel and stuff to transpile to uh, ECMAScript 5 um, have a hard time handling stuff that take uh, subclasses, native uh, classes like URL. So I needed to change uh, like using class extent to extend URL to use the uh, delegation so Babel and create react app and stuff like that it doesn't like blow up with the uh, with a class extending native uh, class uh, also had support added supported for the some stuff for cores in some stuff inside the tests so we don't need to like uh, disable uh, security when we run a Azure test in a browser, basically we needed to create custom browsers or custom configuration for browsers to run Karma to disable web security. Uh, and now we can just use the standard browsers that Karma already have. Uh, this is related to the CI prototypes uh, that I'm finishing. Also debugged uh, another Another thing related to URL that I thought was related to ISO uh, URL, but it isn't basically somewhere in the IPFS code, probably to P2P, um, IPFS, uh, IPv6 um, addresses are not kind of using brackets when they build an URL. So uh, that gives an error now with uh, my package, my URL package. Uh, I don't even know how that works before. Either we only now are starting to see IPv6 uh, IPs or something was hiding this stuff before. I don't know which one is it, but uh, Vasco is uh, <coughs> trying to figure out what's happening, happening there and fixing that stuff. Also related to the bundle size pull requests, uh, while trying trying to fix Amplex, uh, I basically gave up on making it work with the readable streams too. I uh, already asked Jacob for some help, but uh, in the meantime, I'm trying to fix the pull streams to stream the package that basically right now uh, returns uh, some really old and non-standard interface for a stream. I'm trying to make it uh, return a proper readable stream 3. Uh, basically, that's kind of done. Uh, basic, my basic tests uh, pass, but right now I'm trying to run the... Um, the current test that that package um, has, and it's weird stuff in there. So I'm strong, struggling a bit, but uh, uh, I'll probably be able to finish that 
uh, fast. Um, so I already talked about the, oh, uh, I also finished adding cough support for the Karma setup. This is also related to the CI prototypes. Uh, and basically that's it. I'm, as I said, locked on the amplex and switch pull requests about the bundle size. And now uh, we'll try to finish that stuff this week. I'll also, I will also try to finish the pull stream to stream and the uh, CI prototypes. Any questions? It, just, it occurs to me when you were talking about the invalid IPv6 URLs, that was a bug fixed on multi-adder to URI like last week that fixes that. And I can see that's a dependency of JSIPFS. I'm assuming you tracked it down already. Yeah, Alan uh, mentioned it. Uh, uh, that is already being used uh, in some places, but we found some other places that are not using it. So uh, somewhere uh, we will need to either start using it or some find some other way. Okay. The thing that bugs me is that it's like I don't really think we are only now started to see IPv6. Uh, Something else changed. Yeah. But we only now start to see the error. So something weird is going on. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, thank you very much. And Alan Shaw, how's it going? Okay. Uh, just before we head off on what I've I've been doing I, I, on that point that we were just talking about. The, there is a couple of instances with RTC and WebSockets where it, it is just extract, like they're trying to dial two particular addresses and it's extracting out um, an IPv6 address and it's not placing it in um, square brackets. Um, so that's, that's likely the cause. Um, and I'm guessing, Hugo, that actually your library, because that ch that's the thing that changed, is better at validating that, those URLs. And that's probably why we didn't see it before. But um, yeah, anyway. Okay, so let me share my... Hugo has a response. Here's just a quick one. Um, that's uh, the code path that, um, is going through the pool, the WS. And so it's all related to WebSockets. Uh, and we used to use uh, a library to kind of build related uh, URLs to use like the window.location and build a WebSocket URL. And I also, with my package, I kind of redid that logic. So, but all of that code goes through either node URL or the browser URL that now are basically the same. So my guess is the, the old related package <coughs> was doing some stuff that masks the error and now it's kind of going straight in and either the browser or the old just uh, errors out because it doesn't handle IPv6 without brackets. Cool, okay. Um, uh, all right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Um, good. Okay, so yeah, last week uh, got released 0 0.34 for JSIPFS. Um, we had to pull the DHT out of this release. It was not stable enough, so it will be in the next release, but there's still a whole bunch of good stuff in there. Uh, like, we made it fast. Uh, it's got some HAMP support in MFS, which is great because we can put in really, really big directories and have them sharded. Um, we got some uh, IPNS uh, features and things, uh, and we got the CID handling stuff. So you can use the CID base and this uh, in the command line and the um, and in the HTTP API um, to have your um, CIDs come back as uh, whatever base you'd, you'd like them to be. So that's awesome. We also got your new web UI. As, as new as it is. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of kind of API changes, which we've already talked about um, and have come across problems in the website and stuff. 
um, object change. We've got um, like files stuff. We talked about the file stuff and being some uh, some of these things moving to different places. Uh, we added some cool API methods. Uh, DHT stuff. Yeah, the not doesn't matter so much because we took it out the release. Um, uh, and then look, we've got this new section which thanks everyone who did it. Uh, and there, there are a lot of people. Like, look how many people have come and have. Uh, have contributed to this release. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, so th this is like JS IPFS, but also uh, like libp2p and dependent modules in the IPFS ecosystem. So not just JS IPFS, uh, but it, they are all depended on or used by JS IPFS. So yeah, loads of fun, fun times, fun people, good people doing good work. Um, so yeah, what else? Uh, cool. Okay, so the IPLD uh, Ethereum and IPLD Git um, libraries didn't have their browser builds enabled. Basically, they were working because Azure builds them, but they weren't being like they were in the Git ignore the disk directory. So when they when they were published to npm, the disk directory didn't go to up there to either. So um, that was a fairly easy fix to add an npm ignore which didn't ignore the disk folder. Um, so that's good, and I did that because. Um, uh, I saw that Hugo was uh, is doing, or I saw, I, I know that Hugo is doing a whole bunch of work on making the bundle size smaller in the browser, which is super awesome. And the uh, the pull request against IPFS at the moment removes the IPLD formats that are not uh, the default ones, like DAG CPP or DAG PP. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so that the bundle size is super small, but then you don't get to use these things in the browser. Um, and I remember David Diaz saying uh, something about loading these things dynamically um, as and when they're needed. And I thought, well, we could keep the bundle size really small, but we could also just um, load them from IPFS. So dog fooding, getting them from IPFS, nice, nice sort of CDN stuff, because it's, it's, that's what IPFS is essentially um i created a repo uh, which which extracts all of the um, browser builds of the ipld formats and um, puts them in a folder and then you can just add that to ipfs so that looks something like this at the moment for the latest versions but um you can just run this a script again and it'll pull down any new ones and create the folders and then you can just pin that new um that new uh directory uh, but it kind of looks like this and so you you can basically just put like index.js in in a script tag on your page and it'll it'll it's like the ipfs cdn uh, which is cool but also it means that you can we can like the in um ipld there's this feature called load format which um which i added <laughs> but it allows us to uh like load formats dynamically so if ipld doesn't know about a format it will call this function and you can asynchronously like go get that format and um uh, and then provide it to IPLD and it, whatever IPLD was doing, it could continue to do. Uh, so the, because these are now on IPFS, when it calls load format, it can just go and grab it from IPFS, like IPFS cat, and then the path to this, this thing. So that's kind of fun. Um, I have a pull request open um, for it. Uh, and there's a video talking a bit more about it. Um, there are some hurdles with that. Like if you, if you are like start your node and you're offline or have poor connectivity and then try and get stuff, uh, I'm not sure how you would go and get something if you couldn't, if you didn't have it locally. Well, I guess if you had something locally in a format that wasn't, well, why would you have it locally if you hadn't already resolved it? Anyway, the point is uh, like, unless the, um, formats are bundled with IPFS, then they're not bundled with IPFS, so you have to have network connectivity to go get them, right? Uh, so, like, I, there is a pull request on JS IPFS. I haven't put the link in there. I'll put it in the doc. In the doc. Um, but I'm interested to hear your, like, opinions on it. I know Lytle and Hugo have already commented, and I need to read them. Um, but, yeah, I, could, I sort of thought it was a fun, fun thing to do. So, <laughs> there you go. But, like... Uh, it's kind of, uh, it's there. Uh, I don't know if, if I'll merge it or not. We'll see. Yeah, like a, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, 
So that's done. The other interesting thing for you guys is if you're using Meteor, which I know uh, some of you have in the past, uh, you can or will soon be uh, uh, able to bundle it in uh, in Meteor. In and there's a I just saw this today, so I quickly fixed it. Um, weirdly, in package JSON, we've got like uh, in the browser field, uh, we've got like uh, we, like IPFS HTTP client false and IPFS false. What? For some so that's that's kind of weird. Like, why would you depend? Why would this module depend on itself? Um, which it doesn't. So I just removed them. But like weirdly in Meteor, that makes Meteor not bundle. <laughs> it's like this module, um, and so removing them. I don't see any. Like I can't think of any reason why why they shouldn't just be removed. So I just removed them and just running the test now and hopefully. And I tested it with Meteor, and it works now, um, whereas before it didn't. So easy fix. Anyway, um, that's me. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, I'm not blocked on anything at the moment. Um, I started the CID base 32 um, migration thing with starting with JS CID, changed the default. If you call two string or two base encoded string on a CID, and it's a version one CID, then it will be printed out as um, a base 32 string, not a base 58 string. Uh, and that's going to break a whole bunch of things. <laughs> so, this, uh, is, this is it. This is the start of the big change the defaults crusade. Yeah, exactly. The, the thing is, like, all of the tests have like, hard-coded base 58 CIDs. So, <sighs> yeah, I'm just going to have I've started on interface IPFS core now. I just have to slowly work my way through. Um, but this but is... it, it, like, I don't know how this is going to operate with like bit swap and stuff. So I need to, it's, yeah, it's going to get hairy. I think it's not, I don't think it's a simple case of like flip the switch. <laughs> um, so yeah. Exciting times. The pull requests to send. On the, um, the dynamic loading of IPLD resolvers via IPFS, that's very cool. I was wondering, you mentioned that we could use them in script tags on a web page. I think maybe, is that true? Because the gateway won't give them the mime type, the content type won't be set to JavaScript, application JavaScript. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if browsers just ignore it. And if they, they, think, they're, they think they're a little bit more pissy about that these days. Are they? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not the 90s anymore, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> I just squirt anything into well, anywhere, well, <laughs> but it does it does work when loaded via IPFS and wrapped in a function. Does it get, does it not do that for me automatically? What do I right, it, it just occurred to me that um, this is sort of similar to the service worker thing. Like if it did send the right mind type, then anyone could load a service worker for. IPFS. I got it. Look, content type application JavaScript. It knows what it is. It's all uh -oh. good. Response headers. I could just put this in a script tag. That's true. Great. We should also check about the service worker thing. Never mind. Okay, bye. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say, I think. For Red now. Redacted. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Alan Shaw. Um, that is all of the things. So, what is on the agenda? Agenda. Where is it? It's at the top. It's, uh, oh, okay. So, this turned up last night. This is fun. Um, what to do about Chromium V3 manifest. Uh, this is uh, news just in that particularly interesting for the in-web browsers and web extension crowd. Uh, Chrome has made some proposals about where they're going to take the web extensions API next. And the work is being done under the banner of the, the v version 3 manifest. But I think that um, somewhat distracts from the core of the changes they're proposing, which is in an interest of making uh, web extensions have uh, not be able to impact performance of the browser requesting and uh, making HTTP requests. Um, they want to switch from allowing extensions to have programmatic control. So basically have the browser inform web, uh, web extensions about every outgoing HTTP request and then say, is this one? Is this a, a web request that you'd wish to redirect or to block? Um, and that functionality is used heavily by IPFS Companion to allow redirecting to uh, if it sees a valid HTTP flavored IPFS address, it uses this fact to redirect that to your local 
uh, your local IP address, uh, HTTP gateway. Um, also add blockers, any form of uh, web extension based content blocker makes heavy use of this functionality to go and check kind of standard block list and things. Um, the proposal from Chrome is that they're seeing a, a significant performance impact by of having to have every outbound HTTP request go through a list of web extensions and say, hey, web extension, can this can this go? It's a blocking API, so each web extension gets a chance to veto the request. Um, so from a perf angle, it makes uh, it's understandable that this proposal has come through, but their, their proposed fix for it is to basically take away programmatic control and turn it into a declarative API where web extensions have to declare in advance in their manifest, so statically define it, a set of rules for which URLs and how the what behavior the browser should do. So you you tell you give Chrome a, a recipe where you declare it. Yeah, thanks. Declare stuff. So we want to handle every single URL. Um, but there's the other problem. Uh, there's a hard limit of about. They're proposing to add a limit of thirty thousand rules, which I guess is like we said it's going to improve performance. But then if they let web extensions define ten billion rules each, I, I'm guessing that that would still be a lookup hit. Um, but the bigger issue here is like Brave has moved to the Chromium API, Edge is moving to Chromium. Like if they get to call the shots on what the web extension API looks like. So the, and then in the background, like Firefox a year ago or two years ago switched to making their web extension API more like Chrome so that browser web extension vendors could have a shot at making portable web extensions and we moved Companion to that. So this is kind of this is pretty bad news. It's not easy to sugarcoat it. Like we could still, I think we can statically define a rule that like identifies an IPFS path and would redirect that to your local gateway. But we lose functionality around being able to toggle it at runtime as to whether you want to go to the public gateway or a local gateway. And maybe Martin, you you unpacked a few more issues as well. Could you? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well. So like. Um, like more, more in depth uh, notes are uh, on the issue, but basically we do much more right now than looking at the URL and looking if there's like IPFS or IPNS path, like path starting with this segment. We inspect HTTP headers for additional like X IPFS path header as an additional hint that the website may support DNS link. And then we do DNS link lookup to confirm that. Uh, and the web request API is not blo it's not blocking by default. Like making it blocking is an opt-in. Uh, so we are blocking it because we need that. But there are other extensions that don't need to block. They can just asynchronously observe. So I'm not really convinced how how big of a problem is that. Uh, like realistically. Uh, for us, like uh, we will, we would be able to do some things with this proposed API, but we would lose a lot of this sim seamless experience, right? Basically, the the t detection of DNS linked websites would probably go away. Ability to um, re like redirect. Uh, uh, things based on headers or like do header based opt out or uh, maybe even avoiding uh, adding course headers to your local running gateway to have IPFS companion being able to talk to it. It's like sort of a separate issue, but a related one. So uh, what is worth noting is that it's uh, a draft. So this draft uh, may change, and there's already a big backlash against that because, uh, like, the optics are not very good for Google, uh, given the the most important extension that will not be possible to exist is uBlock and uMetrics. So, <laughs> uh, my take on this is to wait for the dust to settle. Uh, people are already posting their use cases in the thread. I, I, I probably wait till uh, the temperature drops a little bit because it's a very heated discussion right now. And then maybe post our, like how we consume uh, those APIs. 
it's like ongoing issue, but we, we need to follow it uh, to ensure we, like to, to make sure we are planning accordingly. Because um, it, it, it would be a shame if this change got rolled out without any. Uh, any yeah, any feedback from yeah. our end and also like, uh, there are multiple, like there are multiple changes that could potentially uh, maybe not break IPFS companion, but would require us to basically rewrite a big chunk of it. Basically, there's like one proposal to remove the concept of background page. It's, it, the, the concept is that there's a background page that is hidden. It's not visible to user, but basically there's a DOM, a HTML DOM, and JavaScript can run in the background on that background page. And they want to remove that and replace that by service worker, which is started and stopped only when this like uh, filter list hits a uh, match, right? Uh, yeah, Oli. Uh, just a quick thought, but um, I think we've explained the existential threat that the V3 <laughs> man of the thing changes. Um, we should talk very quickly about Brave as well. That would be useful just to unpack a little bit more detail of the call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sh should, I, should I like give a quick background on general plan? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so like uh, the plan is uh, in the past, we, as so, like in 2018, the best we could do was to redirect to locally running uh, IPFS, uh, Go IPFS node. So, and Brave had a plan to ship the Tor binary with the browser embedded in the browser. So it was like a hammer and the idea was to, yeah, basically we could do the same for IPFS. And in 2019 now, uh, JSAPFS moved a lot uh, uh, in uh, implementation of things like MFS, uh, DHT will land soon, IPNS over DHT, things like that. So th there's like a feature parity uh, coming along nicely when it comes to JSAPFS. And also Brave uh, themselves uh, figured out a framework for exposing some Chrome OS APIs. So those are more powerful APIs uh, from Chrome OS uh, that are not available in regular Chrome, um, such as raw sockets API, TCP sockets and UDP, and you are able to start your local TCP server or listen to for TCP connections, things like that. Um, so basically the idea is that if we have access to that, those APIs from an IPFS companion and we run JS IPFS in IPFS companion context, then we could have a feature parity with Go IPFS, at least when it comes to uh, starting HTTP gateway and redirecting to local HTTP gateway, uh, just like we do for Go IPFS. But the difference is that there is no binary to worry about it's much easier to audit. Uh, it's much easier to, cause like security parameter for web extension is uh, already de defined. It's a separate uh, process and stuff like that. And uh, also we fully control when we update JS IPFS instance. Uh, generally it's much better experience for shipping and maintaining for both Brave and uh, IPFS companion. So that's the idea. Uh, uh, yeah, um, Oli, do you have a, any questions related to that plan? <laughs> um, no new ones from the last time we spoke, but it was more around, this is gonna be a JS IPFS instance running in the browser context, not a JS IPFS instance running in a node context. Yep. So it's, There's, there is a there is a currently a trade off around like ease of deployment and control from our side versus the performance that you could expect from such a thing. Um, and also, so you were you just saying like we need some solution for HTTP, like we'd have to build out the. Uh, here's how you do uh, HTTP gateway in a browser if such if that API is, is available. Yeah, so basically uh, without that we th this plan won't work if we are not able to expose HTTP gateway um, mm. from embedded JS IPFS node. Uh, another like so sort of 
a prerequisite for that is to add uh, IPFS detection, like native IPFS detection to Brave itself. So uh, Brave will not ship with IPFS companion enabled for everyone, but the first time user is visiting website with IPFS resources or there's like IPFS header uh, in HTTP response or maybe there's a DNS link or maybe user, there's a JavaScript call to window IPFS uh, to enable uh, IPFS API. Uh, then there's like a prompt to user, uh, this website could make use of IPFS, what's the IPFS, would you like to enable it? And then IPFS is started and automatically JS IPFS node starts, uh, things like that. So uh, for this plan to work, we need at least to expose HTTP gateway in some way. And uh, those low level sockets API are the best, the best way or the only way I see right now to do without like third party software. Okay, it's nearly on the hour. Um, I would, it would be nice for folks to check the Brave issue because I think there is, there are some things to unpack on the pros and cons of using an embedded JS IPFS as the default. Um, so it'd be good to get people's thoughts on that. As, as once this is rolled out, that would make IPFS a lot more visible to a lot more people. Yep. Uh, we're one minute left, and we've got. We didn't invite Jim Pick to say any words. Jim, did you have anything you wanted to share with the group, or have you just had a nice time? Uh, just having a nice time. Very good. Cool. In which case, um, this has been all Alan Shaw waving us off. Goodbye. Uh, I yeah, I'm, I'm not waving. I'm drowning. Um, uh -oh. the, uh, would it be good to have like a a call where we can just discuss this? Uh, the brave thing like outside of um i think i think this was a little bit rushed today i would have liked to talk a bit more about it exactly. um we can talk a bit more about it now if you know. if i've got to go now okay then let's have a call please um read the issue add your thoughts there and we'll schedule a call from that sweet thanks everybody uh, IPFS GUI and in web browsers, weekly sync, same time, same place, next week. Bring your GUI and in web browsers ideas and we will talk about them. Bye bye. See ya.